Are we good? In a moment. Ah, I believe as of approximately right now, we should be live. Let me, uh, I got to come back here and bring everyone into the new session room. Just a second. It should ask me to do that. Hey, Michael. <laughs> I didn't say that. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad, glad. Uh, I'm glad everyone okay. got the memo of wearing a checkered shirt and, um, <laughs> and drinking a ton of coffee. That's great. That's all right. That, that works for me. Uh, so, okay. I think we are good. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second talk of the meeting. Um, let, it's my absolute, absolute pleasure to introduce a, uh, a squad from Arizona State out of the, uh, the, the orbit of uh, Manfred Laubickler's group. So this is Cody O'Toole, Ken Aiello, and Michael Simeone, uh, work they also did with Manfred Laubickler there at ASU. And they'll be talking to us today about the thematic evolution of human genome research. So with that, take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Charles. So yeah, I'm Cody O'Toole with my colleagues here, and then we're going to be talking about the thematic evolution of human genome research. Oh, oops. There we go. Um, so I'm a PhD candidate uh, at Arizona State University, and uh, I'm focusing on biology with a special focus on biology and society. And then uh, the reason for doing this research is I'm looking to go into industry. So I'm looking into the efficacy, the re reproducibility, and the scalability of this model that we go ahead and make here. And then also I'm with uh, Ken Aeo, who is a postdoctoral research, researcher with ASU GBCI. And then Michael Simeone, who is the director for data science and analytics at ASU. And then of course our PI is Manfred Lubickler, and then he has many tiles, but um, he's the director of School of Complex Adaptive Systems and the director of GBCI at ASU. So to go ahead and get started, um, just, just like a little bit of an abstract, human genome research is an important landmark in biomedical research and has received the benefit of considerable resources and attention due to the human genome project and an important role of genomics in modern medicine. So due to that attention and resources given to the human genome research, there are long-standing conjectures about what themes are present at specific times and which themes will emerge in the future. So to do that, we go ahead and take this human genome corpus and we implement a novel dynamic topic model and then we use domain expertise via two landmark papers as a guide to what themes should appear in this corpus at specific time slices. And then so overall, our results will show the evolution, duration, and trajectory of the topics and themes in the corpus. So just a little bit of a timeline and history about the Human Genome Project. And then this uh, graph is made with our data. So uh, papers per year, you can go ahead and see it increase over time. Then towards the end, it kind of plateaus and starts to decrease a little bit. But to begin in 1989, the HHS created the um, NCHGR, which is later in 1997 called what we know now as the NHGRI. And so the kind of the big first paper that we see in 1994 is the Human Genome Project reaches its first mapping goal, which is a com comprehensive human genetic linking map. So these uh, genetic linkage maps show the relative order and of, uh, of an approximate spacing between specific DNA patterns positioned on chromosomes. So these linkage maps can be used as one of the first tools that researchers can use to find disease causing genes, which is really important. And then later in 1996, which is kind of this big thing that happened during the Human Genome Project, which kind of influenced the way that um, genome research is done today is the Bermuda Principles, which encouraged the open access release of data uh, to boost the benefit of human genome research towards society. Coming towards the end of the Human Genome Project in 1999, we see that the, um, they sequenced the first human chromosome, and then seeing this organization of the human chromosome for the first time at this level paves the way for the rest of the Human Genome Project, which is really influential for them to get to the finish. So in 2001, we see two papers uh, from Venter et al. at Solera, and then uh, the International Human Genome Sequencing Consor Consortium, also in 2001, uh, from the NHGRI. And then this is their draft of the human genome sequence. And then two years later, their final data comes out and then the human genome project is concluded. At that same time, Collins et al. Uh, published a blueprint for their vision of the future of genomic research, which is our first landmark paper that we'll be talking about next. Then in 2011, Green et al. Uh, reflect on the previous 10 years of genomic research and plots a course towards an era of genomic medicine, which is our second landmark paper that we'll be talking about. So overall, the impacts of the Human Genome Project on human genome research as it moves forward and as we see it today, it spurred of technological advancements in sequencing 
as NIH and Solera raced to the finish, which in the end, they ended up combining forces to get to finish the project. But at the time they're racing, which caused these big advances in the way that sequencing, sequencing is done, which enabled them to actually do this in a shorter time period than they initially predicted. Additionally, this is a new era of digital biology emerged from parallel developments in computational power and human genome project sequencing technologies, which is also kind of part of this Bermuda principles, where it also helped them with these open access of data, which is really important moving forward. With all this, and then uh, with all these advancements and everything, the power of those were revealed in a series of post-human genome projects. So we have the haplotype mapping project, the thousand genomes project, the cancer genome atlas, then we also have the human microbiome project. There are others too, but these are some of the big ones that occurred after this. And then, so these projects were emblematic of advancing, uh, advancement of scaling digitization and sharing that was sparked by the human genome project. Additionally, we see some key uh, shifts in other fields that this was sparked, that the Human Genome Project caused. So we can see in medicine, there's publicly available resources that have identified multiple genes associated with disease. Uh, we also have an enabling more accurate and objective diagnoses. And then diverse types of cancer tubers are more easily identified. And this all came from the, uh, basically what we learned about the Human Genome Project and then our increase in uh, technology and everything allowed us to learn more about these genes and be able to identify diseases a little bit more easy. So for in forensic, we have CODIS. And then so basically we can identify people with an extremely small sample size. So it could just be like a few skin cells, saliva, hair, blood, semen, things like that. And as an increase in sensitivity over time. In anthropology, this is one of the really cool ones that I found out about was that uh, through the open access comparative DNA samples, we we're able to learn about where modern populations came from. And then so this uh, uh, enabled molecular anthropologists to confirm Africa is the cradle of modern species, Homo sapiens, which I thought was very interesting. And then, of course, the big one is in biology. So this is, this is the essential for the emergence of systems biology, enabling the researchers to have all the parts for a complex biological system. And then uh, this also led to the emergence of proteonomics and transformed the understanding of evolution. Overall, these genomes provide insight into how diverse organisms from microbes to human are connected and the genealogical tree of life, clearly demonstrating that all of our species that, ex that exist today descend from a single an ancestor. So that really uh, transformed our understanding of how evolution was. So to go ahead and go over our first landmark paper, which is really important for the rest of this research, is the uh, vision for the future of genomics research. And this is by Collins et al. in 2003. This basically lays out the blueprint for the future of genomics research. And this blueprint is built on three foundational interactions, as you can see from their picture on the right. It goes from genomics to biology, then to health, then to society. So basically what their kind of goals are is the more we learn about biology, then the more we can help and, and learn more about human health. And then once we have all those facets, we can go ahead and build on that and then expand into how that'll benefit society. So it's kind of this stepping stone of basically starting with this into biology, then we can go to health, then we can go into the larger society. So this blueprint is based on the themes of identifying structural and functional com components encoded in the human genome, defining genetic networks and protein pathways as they show how the, they contribute to organismal phenotypes. And then they also want to focus on how the variation can correlate with phenotypic differences in the genomes, and then how we can understand the evolutionary variation based on this kind of phenotypic variation across species. Then one of their last points is developing policy options, which facilitate the use of genome in information. So this calls for interdisciplinary collaboration to reach these goals. But additionally, they call for the need for many parallel developments so genomics research can uh, progress. So basically, we have we need computational power, storage facilities, more sense of sequencing tech. Those kind of technological advancements is what they need to be able to take these goals, because they would need massive amounts of data and, and more sense of equipment to get to all this. So they suggest these large scale genomic strategies will be imperative to empower human health advancements. And they also put special emphasis on the genetic contribution to diseases and how they can be used to improve drug development and predict drug response. In our second paper, charting a course for genomic medicine from base pairs to bedside, this is more focused on the, um, the future of genomics medicine. So they're really looking at taking this next step from everything that we've learned in genomics to really applying it to human health and making human health uh, more accessible, uh, more easily diagnosed, things like that. So this is basically a, a vision for the next 10 years of genomic research and then a little bit past that as well. 
And then this argues how genome research will advance by further understanding the biology of genomes, the genetic basis of disease, the science of medicine, and the effectiveness of genomics in healthcare. This paper further builds on the 2003 paper that we, that we just mentioned and calls for more understanding of genome biology and sees it as, as its implications in human health as the next stepping stone. So this brings a much more articulated plan of how improving genomic understanding of disease can improve healthcare in areas of diagnostics, therapeutics, and clinical trials. So in diagnostics, they're trying to increase the accuracy and make it a little bit easier just to go ahead and figure out which disease a person may have. In therapeutics, they're trying to make properly effective drug development through pharmacogenomics. So they're basically trying to make it to where they can map the response that a person will have to a drug and then also give a person a drug that's going to be effective and then won't have adverse side effects. Then also in clinical trials, they're uh, focused on the efficacy through genomics-based stratification. So they're trying to improve the validity and make it so it is a more stratification system where they can basically stratify the clinical trials based on their genomic uh, backbone. That way they can actually get a better reading of how the drug does, because right now they do it in a more homogeneous approach where they assume that everyone has the same uh, genome. So then it doesn't actually give us the best results for the drugs. That's why some people have really bad ad adverse side effects. So this again calls for many parallel developments in computational power to accuracy to assess the big data that is genomics. So this um, also puts emphasis on the further understanding of the human microbiome to make robust uh, disease tr treatment. They note this, this is an important role in the genetic interaction networks. So basically the authors value the emergence of metagenomics, which in their words, offers unprecedented opportunities for understanding the role of endogenous microbes and the microbial communities in the human health and disease, since many diseases are influenced by microbial communities that inhabit our bodies. Overall, they focus strongly on specific drug development for subsets of human populations based on their genetic similarity, and then this can all come from our understanding, further understanding of the human microbiome and how that in, impacts our disease understanding. So to go ahead and go over our data, so we went ahead and gathered 7,965 documents from PubMed Central, ranging from 1989 to 2018, so over this 30-year period. And we use this key search term of human genome project, which is kind of gave us a look into what human genome research was doing. Um, so overall, we have 25 million tokens. So that's just all words of all types going through. And then we have 422,000 unique words. And then so our token type race ratio is 0 0.0165. And then this token type ratio shows that a corpus is how diverse it is lexically. So we can see with such a small value, that it's more, it's lexically undiverse. And then because the closer to one it is, the more diverse this corpus will be. So this is likely due to the solidified nature of the field. So as we saw in the little graph that we made in the later years, there's so many papers. And then this uh, is more in a plateau type of growth. So we're seeing that this field is more solidified and then their ideas are more cohesive compared to the early years where there's many new ideas, many new things happening. So this kind of uh, overshadows the, the earlier years where there might have been more life school diversity. Um, so our data analysis methods, we use some basic corpus linguistic me methods such as word frequency and collocation. Then we use a natural uh, language processing method as TF-IDF. And then we go ahead and use a machine learning natural language processing combination that is dynamic embedded topic model, which I'll go ahead and get into later. But to go ahead and start, here's our word frequency here. So this is really important step to get a high level understanding of the corpus. It really helps us check whether or not it's clean and lets us see kind of how things change, what's important in the corpus, and we can kind of just overall learn more about it. So there's nothing really unexpected here, but this is a helpful way to verifying how clean it is, like I said, and then seeing which uh, words emerge in the corpus just from raw frequencies, as we can see on the right. So. Um, we can go ahead and see that in, after the Human Genome Project finishes, we can see that cancer really appears into the corpus around the same time that the 2003 paper came out. Um, so it's really interesting to see. And then also in the later years, we see that clinical starts to emerge into the top 20 words. And then so um, this is basically historically validated on the predictions from the 2011 genomic medicine era, along with the continued use of genomics and therapeutic research. So we can kind of see that our data is clean and it's following the historical trajectory that we expected. So the TF-IDF is the term frequency inverse document frequency. So basically it is, we find the term frequency and then the inverse document uh, frequency, and then we multiply those together to get this TF-IDF. And then it gives us the most important words in a document in comparison to a collection of other of the documents. So 
In this analysis, we use each time slice as its own document in comparison to the collection of other documents, i.e. the other time slices. So doing it in this way enables us to find the most important words in each time period in comparison to the other 25 years of human genome research. So it really helps us see what's most important in each time slice in comparison to everything else. So we can go ahead and see like in the final years when clinical starting to appear, we can see just how important clinical was in that time period compared to every other year that might've been used in clinical. So we can go ahead and see here, on the left we have our TF-IDF table, and then on the right we have Jacquard similarity. So that's just helping us see how similar each year is, over each time slice is over time. So we can go ahead and basically, if the, so we have 1989 to 1993, and then we did the Jacquard similarity of 1994 to 1998 compared to the first time slice, and then that's how it goes. So that's why we see on the graph that it starts in 1994. So we're basically just comparing the uh, T plus one to T. So we can go ahead and see that these are fairly similar across time, but there is a drop in similarity before between 2004 to 2008. So directly after the first paper and the finish of the Human Genome Project. So what we really learn about that is that basically we're seeing that this that the Human Genome Project kind of has this kind of cohesive uh, focus that they're doing. And then after it finishes, it, it really expands the ideas that are possible. So this causes a dip in, in similarity. And then we go ahead and see that the similarity increases. So then we can see that the, it's starting to plateau in the uh, uh, basically the corpus is starting to come back together and becoming more co cohesive again. So basically then at the end, we can see that the field stabilizes and finally the, two, the final two time slices suggest that the field is solidified like I just uh, mentioned. And we can see that cancer appears as an important word and a rise in TF-IDF score. And then we can also see that whether, even though it's not really, high, it's only highlighted in one spot, we can see that patient rises also in score. Then on the other side, we see MAP, clone, health, and family disappear out of the top 20 TF-IDF scores, and health is replaced with more specific variants such as cancer, patient, and clinical. So we can kind of see that this general idea of health is basically disappearing while a more focused version is appearing into the corpus. So this suggests that genomic-based medicine is converging to specific applications as technology advances rather than focusing on the overall concept of human health. Next, we went ahead and did collocates. So as you can see by uh, J.R. Firth in the, in the top right, I think this is the best explanation of collocates. You shall know a word by the company it keeps. So collocates provide contextual information about words and the meaning of words not explicitly mentioned in the text. Collocates are often used to show the variation in language use and context. So these words co-occur with this node word repeatedly in combinations throughout the corpus. So the significance of these combinations are measured through association measures. Measures So we use the T-score association measure since it's often robust in breaches of normality assumption uh, in breaches of the normality assumption, and then is often scores collocates with a higher frequency of co-occurrence with a larger value, as we found in our previous research in the law of Eckler lab. Collocates here are used to validate the historical trajectory of the human genome research and learn how specific words change in meaning over time. So based on our two landmark papers, our word frequency list and our TF-IDF words, we were able to select seven words to analyze through collocations with the T-score association measure. So we chose clinical, disease, drug, gene, health, microbiome, and policy. So our first one, we have clinical. And here in clinical, the collocates, we see a high degree of similarity over time. But with the highlighted cells, we can see that we can verify the suggestions from the 2011 paper where the genomics medicine era was focusing on proving clinical trials, the validity, as well as the field of pharmacogenetics being an important driver in this move. So this is really, we can go ahead and see that these predictions in the 2011 paper are happening at relatively the same time. And then we can go ahead and see that this, uh, that clinical is relatively increasing over time in similarity, even though there's a massive increase in uh, frequency of the word. So disease, this is a really interesting one to analyze as the similarity of disease collocates increased over time, but we can clearly see that there's shifts in specific diseases that were of most importance to study in human genome research. So we see Alzheimer's keeps in importance over time, but Huntington's that starts in the first column really disappears um, afterwards. And then, so, and then we can see a wider range of diseases appearing, ranging the entire body. Uh, indicating parallel developments in technology and a deeper understanding of genome biology and genetic networks has given researchers the opportunity to tackle a vastly wider range of disease-related problems. 
Next, we have drug, which is a really important part of both papers. So we can see that the uh, development of colicates increases as the Human Genome Project finishes and the 2003 paper is introduced. So even though that there is a substantial increase in the raw frequency of the word drug, the top 20 colicates stay similar over time. And then at the beginning of this, we can see the 1989-1993 time slice that HIV is an important topic for drug development. Then later in the last time slice, we see that uh, the anti-cancer drugs become a much more important focus, which is historically verified by the substantial increase in cancer research. And then an interesting finding is the appearance of pharmacogenomics and genetics in the 1999 to 2003 time slice, where the 2003 paper puts some emphasis on further understanding the field, and the 2011 paper put a uh, stronger impotence on this importance, and then the future, and the end is uh, importance in the future of genomic medicine to improve human health. So it's really interesting that it appeared much earlier than the 2011 paper indicated. Next, we have Gene. Gene was uh, the one that I was really most excited to analyze because uh, gene is basically a really variable concept. It's important to see that its influences in the human in the era of human genome research. And then what I've seen in my previous research is that there's basically a there's multiple gene concepts over time. And then so to see that the similarity is basically the same is really interesting to see this in this era of human genome research. So we see that in these highlighted words that there's this emergence of need to understand the heritable variation in genes across populations. And that becomes an important aspect of the research and the timeline that the 2003 paper suggested and the 2011 paper emphasized. So we're kind of going, we're seeing here that the predictions of those landmark papers are really coming to fruition just from our call kits. Next, we did health. Health stabilizes in similarity over time as the field solidified. And then we can go ahead and say, see that disease and disparity emerges after the finish of the Human Genome Project and the 2003 paper. So this is historically verified through our landmark paper, where they call for the need for this research to be used in a way to reduce health disparities across the globe. So this one was also really interesting because the microbiome didn't actually appear in the corpus until 2007. So that's why we go ahead and have no call kits for any time before that. And then, and then this is just before the official start of the Human Microbiome Project though during this time the NIH was funding the research of microbiome heavily. And then so th then we see that the increase in similarity and its relation to health starts to appear in the top colicates. But by the time that our times, uh, our analysis time ended at 2018, there was not as much as we'd like to see in the microbiome. So I'm assuming that it probably continues to appear more heavily into 2021. Then the last one, policy, which both papers emphasize at the end that we needed uh, policy on basically open access to the data, policy on drug uh, development and technology. So the policy increases in similarity over time. And after we see the 2003 paper, that the implications of drug development, technolo technological advancements, and open policy through open data release, because it's an important part of the conversation. So we can really see that start to change here. Summary and next steps of everything that we've done so far. So human genome research is advanced through the completion of the Human Genome Project and parallel developments in multiple fields, leading to an era of genomic medicine aimed to improve human health. The analysis to this point has verified how clean our corpus is, and then it has also been verified by the historical trajectory of human genome research and shown that the predictions of the two landmark papers came to fruition. Next, we, uh, we use the novel dynamic topic model to track the thematic evolution of the human genome corpus. This analysis will be validated uh, by the word frequency, TF-IDF, and collocation results along with the two landmark papers as guides. This will enable us to also see how influential each paper is in the field. So real quick, topic models enable the characterization of themes found in the corpus by highlighting words that co-occur into clustered ideas or phrases. The topic model shows themes, language, context, and high-level knowledge found within the corpus, and then this can help us under, uh, find distinctive patterns of words that appear together. So we can go ahead and see in this picture that is basically finding these groups of kind of words that are following these same ideas based on its other co-occurring words, and then it puts them into similar topics. So the most common use is the LDA, it is an unsupervised machine learning applications that uses each document as a mixture of topics. And then it, it predicts the proportion of, to of topics for any document using Markov chain, Gibbs sampling, and Bayesian non-parametric. I can go ahead and explain those later if anyone has any questions on that. And then a downfall of this model is that it suffers from inaccurate topics when using a large corpus, I mean, a large diverse uh, vocabulary. And then to combat this, researchers can often prune their data sets, but that can limit the scope and miss hidden themes, which is basically the whole reason that we're doing this research is to find the, the themes. So we don't want to do that. So there's this other method 
called the embedded topic model. And then this basically marries the traditional LDA with word embeddings. And then so word embeddings in low level dimensional spaces are able to keep semantic properties of words, thereby increasing the, co the coherence of topics and enabling the use of larger vocabularies. So the ETM assigns topics based on the words location in the embedding space. Then it uses a long linear model that takes the inner product of the word embeddings matrix and the topic embedding. So with this form, the ETM assigns a high probability to a word in a topic by measuring the agreement between the words embedding and the topics embedding. But this still has many of the same problems as the LDA because these both are unable to model over time. And then so they're static fuzzy and give different results each time due to the probabilistic nature of the model. And then also it does not, uh, it doesn't help understand how meaning changes over time because they are static. So to analyze the evolution of topics, we need to have a dynamic model. So the first dynamic topic model by Bly and Lafferty in 2006 is an extension of the LDA. It basically is the same model, but uses a probabilistic time series to enable models to the topics to vary over time. And this is done by basically chaining the parameters of each topic in a state space model. So as you can see from their picture on the right from their paper, that is running through like it would normally, but then it's chaining the parameters together. That way it's able to model it over time. So it's actually changing uh, each probability based on the time slice as well. And then this model will, since it's an LDA, will suffer from the original LDA model. So we need the dynamic embedded topic model. This was made by Diang and Ruiz and Bly. So the DETM uses a varying vector on the word embedding space to model each topic over time, resulting in more accurate topics uh, topic coherence and topic diversity where semantically similar words are assigned to similar topics since the representations are close in dimensional space. So we split the documents into sentences and treat, e treat each sentence as its own document, which makes the model a little bit easier to work, uh, work with. And then it also makes it so there's not words from other sentences making it into our skip gram model. So after using the skip gram, the, this embeds them into dimensional space. We were able to run the DETM with 10 epochs, a learning rate of 0 0.001 and a batch size of 200. Normally we would do at least 100 epochs, but we ran this on my laptop, which is only eight gigabytes of RAM and we have a massive data set. So it made it a little bit hard to do more. And then this model basically ran for about five days on my computer. Um, so we weren't able to run it any longer at this point in time. But we can see, as I mentioned with the corpus size, so the documents that were being used were 718,798. So that was basically, basically all sentences. And then we trained on 611,000 basically, and then we validated each epoch with the uh, 35,941. So basically that just goes through and then we're able to validate and see if the perplexity over time is changing. And if it's lowering, then it stays, but if it gets high again, then we reduce the learning rate. Then we test on 71,879, and then our vocab size was about 14,000. So what we have on the right here is basically the uh, data sets from the Diang et al. 2019 paper that invented this model. And then also from then we see that the second table is the uh, perplexity ratings. And then the third table is the topic coherence, diversity, and quality, which is the quantitative validation metrics for the UN data set, which is the most comparable in size to our HD corpus. So we can see that our perplexity, which is the predictive uh, performance, at which lower is better. Uh, is 2065. And then, so if we see that on the right, that is better than almost all of them, except for the DETM for the UN data set. So we believe that if we were to run this for more epochs, this would be rel relatively the same size as the UN perplexity. Then topic diversity is a uh, is relatively similar for the, it's actually a little bit better for the, uh, oh wait, sorry. Yeah, topic diversity is the one in the middle. It is way worse. Then there are other ones, and then this is because the topic diversity is a percentage of unique words in the top 25 words of each topic. And we found that 82% of our topics were 95% uh, the same top 20 words, which this would account for a low topic diversity. But then we see an extremely high topic coherence where theirs is only about 0.1 and ours is 0.78. And then this topic coherence is a quantitative measure of the interpretability of a topic. So since so many of our topics were essentially the same, that would account for a high topic coherence which then gave us a topic quality of 0.13, which is on par with the other ones. It's a, it's a little bit higher than these ones at this point. So then we can go ahead and do our modeling and we can go ahead and see what the influence of these papers are and other things. And then so we can go ahead and see that there's an exponential increase in the probability for drug and network, which occur, uh, uh, occurs one year after the introduction of the 2003 landmark paper. Then we see on the left that we have these citations and we see that they're 
the largest amount of citations that this paper ever got in one time in one year was in 2004. This is extracted from Scopus. So this is coupled with a large amount of citations for that paper. In the same year, this is suggested that the paper is a strong, one of the stronger drivers of this change alongside other parallel developments. So the drug development and genetic networks are some of the main themes of the 2003 paper alongside technological advancements and needing a deeper genetic variant and evolutionary understanding. So this one is the DTM for the cancer topic that we found. And then we can see cancer related terminology increases over time while protein decreases. And then this is historically verified through our TF-IDF words and word frequency analysis. So this is also a validating factor for the quality of use of the DETM. As we can see that the, uh, we expected cancer, cancer related terminology to increase over time. And we saw that protein also decreased over time. So this is really validates that our DETM was on par with our uh, other analyses. Then our next one was the microbiome. So gut and microbiota increased exponentially two years after the 2011 paper. So it's unlikely that the paper is a stronger, strong influence, but rather the influence of the human microbiome project uh, of the proposed end date is really what started this. So um, just after the HMP finishes, the probability of those words dramatically increase, which is something really interesting, which we might go ahead and analyze at a later time. But basically the Human Microbiome Project ran from 2008 to 2016, and they published over 650 papers, and I think they had over 75,000 citations so far. And then the purpose of this was the comprehensive characterization of human microbiota and their role in human health and disease. So this is uh, really interesting. And then we can see this is probably one of the bigger drivers for this uh, topic in comparison to the 2011 paper, which is probably a smaller driver. Then uh, we see that this, while the 2011 paper is strongly focused on genomic medicine, we see that the idea of genomic medicine is increasing throughout the entire period of the corpus, and that one paper would not have the strongest influence in a well-developed field at this time. And then these are also, also qualitatively verified through the frequency and uh, TF-IDF. So we can really see that this 2011 paper, while many of its predictions did come to fruition, it was not it, kind of a main driver in comparison to this 2003 paper where we see an exponential increase in those words after this paper was released. So to conclude, um, using a combination of digital and traditional uh, methods through domain expertise, we we're able to assess the thematic evolution of human genome research. Our digital analysis includes the triangulation for multiple methods such as corpus linguistics, NLP, and machine learning. And then we see that these two papers we presented as domain expertise are one of the main contributing factors in a highly interdisciplinary field of research. So we found that the 2003 paper had more influence on the trajectory of human genome research. And then we found that this paper was very much supported by all the results. And then while the 2011 paper predicted many of the th themes correctly, they were a smaller driver of influence compared to other parallel developments, such as the Human Microbiome Project. So this, so these basically, the domain at the 2011 paper had a certain momentum and inertia at this point. It was really growing, it was starting to solidify. And then part of this inertia are common research questions, methods, key concepts, and debates, which stabilized and grew over time. This would prevent the 2011 paper to deter or change the field. So as the field and corpus grew, it'd be harder for a single paper or even factor to exert a similar amount of influence compared to the 2003 paper, because a bigger corpus equals less influence for that single paper. So since it wasn't solidified at the time of the 2003 paper, this gave it more room and chance to influence the field, which we saw that it most likely did. So overall, the combination of digital and traditional methods enables us to more effectively model and characterize the evolution, duration, trajectory of themes in an entire scientific field compared to using only one of those methodologies. So using the combination of methods, we were also able to verify and measure the influence of domain experts before and after the field of human genome research solidified. I'd like to go ahead and acknowledge uh, GBCI, the School of Complex uh, Adaptive Systems and the Santa Fe S Institute. And I'd like to thank my colleagues for all their help and everything and helping me put this together. And then I'd also like to thank the Pence Lab and DS2 for having us. Fantastic. Thank you so much. This is uh, what a great talk. This is uh, thinking about combining the, the citation network type analysis with, uh, uh, with the text analysis is uh, something we've been work we've been thinking about a lot. And that's a really, really cool way to do it. So let me go, uh, let me go to some questions here from the audience. Uh, 
hear from uh, Stefan Linquist. That's a, this is very impressive work. I'm interested in what's the null expectation uh, for that similarity measure. So do you expect that to generally go up or, or to decrease as a, as a project matures? What do you, what would you, what would you expect to see? Yeah. So I'm assuming the similarity measure was the Jacquard similarity measure. But basically, we don't really, there's no like know what we expect it to do because it is basically just going, it is just the um, intersection divided by the union. So we're kind of just expecting to see some sort of change or maybe stabilization. But the way that this is really verified whether this is accurate or not is through these traditional methods where we get a deeper understanding of the corpus before we do these analysis methods. So with health, we really did expect it to increase over time because that was something that we know was an important part of this human genome research. And it was also something that uh, we knew as the field grows, it's gonna become more um, cohesive and solidified. And these ideas are gonna really start to come together and people are gonna start, it would be like this uh, citation network. It would start to grow and grow and grow as time builds and as the field gets bigger. So we expected something to be similar to that. So that was kind of our null expectation for a lot of those. The one that I thought went against kind of my null expectation is I thought that the gene uh, Jacquard similarity for uh, collocates would be very variable and changing over time. But um, due to like these very, due to all these different, um, the, the classical gene concept, the molecular gene concept, all those different concepts, I expected the Human Genome Project to take some of those things on and it would be highly variable, but we saw it's very static over time, which I thought was very interesting. Cool, thanks. Uh, next question coming from uh, Stefan Hesperken who asks, uh, have you validated some of these results uh, against existing other kinds of keywords or taxonomy? So I think you mentioned some of this at the end about, about bringing in other kinds of domain knowledge. Can you say a little bit, a little bit more about, about how that's looked? Yeah, um, we didn't really find anything out of, the ordinator, out of the ordinary there. Because this is such an interdisciplinary field, we expected things to be highly variable. But the thing is that we really found a lot of words. For, we honestly found more words about medicine than we did find words about genes at, towards the end which I found was really interesting just because you would not expect it since it is human genome research, you would expect there to be a lot of talk about different components of genes, you know, chromosomes, things like that, alleles, loci, things like that. But we found a lot of health, cancer, disease related terminology, which I found very interesting. Cool, thanks. Uh, next question coming in from uh, uh, John Redisky, who asks, uh, who says, great talk. Uh, do you have any information regarding word frequency within uh, the different sections of a paper? So introduction, methods, results, discussion. Is that is that a thing that your corpus has, has access to or not? Um, that's not necessarily something that we have access to right now, because the way that we do it is we take it from PMC, so we have the full PDF versions, and then we just convert those to text using Python. And then so what that does, it basically has it in certain ways where it is just really these paragraphs are separated by these new line parts in Python. So we don't really have a easy way to do that, but there are really good methods coming out to where you can just go straight from the PDF to um, into Python now, where you can just read it really well like that. So I think that there are ways that we could kind of use like a rejects way to basically split those into certain parts, because I think that that is a really good point in the future of this kind of research using corpus linguistics. It might be really interesting to see how the introduction word frequency differs from the methods and differs from the conclusion. Cool, thanks. Um, question from uh, uh, Christoph Maliter who asks, uh, with the DETM method, so do you specify a total number of topics or do you focus on specific words for, for which you get embedding terms, which would explain why your, why your topics were, were aligned with your focus terms? Yeah, um, so basically the way that their method works is they, um, do their kind of whole processing, separating it into sentences. Then they use the skip grant model to embed it. So then they just really save some time using that. Then the DETM also does the topic embeddings where you set the number of topics and you really do have a long list of things that you can set. So you can set like the uh, kind of the alpha values. You can set which activation functions, your batch size, your learning rate, all that kind of stuff. It really does give you complete freedom to do that kind of thing. But you really do set the topic size. So we had 50 topics. And then add that because we were only able to run it for 10 epochs because it's such a massive model. It's like the LSTM that has linear transformations. So it's just like a massive model and the LSTM already runs slow. So coupling that with other things, plus it trying to learn like multiple forms of embeddings and trying to give those topics probabilities and then over a long time period, that makes it really hard for the model to move quickly. And then I only have eight gigabytes of RAM on this computer. So over, we were only able to get 10 epochs done in time for the conference which we're a little bit sad about, but we did get four really good topics that are really diverse and really show these kind of interesting things. So it just shows that how effective this model can be even with limited training time. Great. Um, last question is, is for me. Uh, 
I can see if any, <laughs> if any more come in. I could, I can, I, I, I chair inserted myself at the back of the line here. Um, so uh, similar kind of, kind of nerdy technical questions. So I've done some co-location analysis before, and I just have to say those are exceptionally clean co-location results. So I wanted to ask you about, okay, if you're going from, from, from PDFs, uh, from PDF to text, what kinds of clean, how much really nasty cleanup did you have to do? I feel that feels like a very, very clean data set. Yeah. Um, so it is really clean, but the nice part is that, so me and my colleague, Ken, we, um, I do my dissertation research on gene drive, which is you know biotechnology and biomedicine. And he does his research on microbiome. So he's a lot of knowledge, but basically we have these two really good stop lists, which you know, they're like a few thousand in length, but we've gone through and we've used the uh, wordsmith and we just gone through like the first 10%, you know, like a few million words. And we're just able to get rid of all those broken words and everything. And then we find that if we're using the same code, it usually breaks the words in similar ways. So that was one of the reasons. And then also when I was going through, I basically went through and I was using this kind of like rejects thing that I made where I had all this, since I had the list of all the author names, I was able to go through and I was able to basically say, hey, if there's like five or six authors in this string right here, just get rid of it. And then also I found that if like most sentences in scientific papers aren't gonna be less than 60 characters. So I removed everything that was less than 60 characters. So we're kind of removing names, things that weren't that helpful, which can also um, impact how clean that the collocation analysis was. Very nice. Yeah, that's that these, these uh, speaking of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Dr. Berner mentioning uh, tacit knowledge during her keynote, these are all these little pieces of, of this tacit knowledge that we all have to figure out how to, uh, yeah. <laughs> how to manipulate. Um, Great. So I don't see any further questions. So a uh, fantastic talk. Thank you so much. And uh, oh, wait, never mind. Wait, wait, we didn't get one. Cool. Uh, uh, Christoph Malatou asks uh, uh, whether or not you, you tried comparing uh, your model against just a good old fashioned uh, vanilla LDA topic model with, you know, 50 topics or something just to see what see what that would result in. Yeah. So um, while that would be really interesting results. Basically, uh, using the vanilla LDA, we wouldn't be able to model over time. And then uh, also, just we found that using the embedded topic model compared to the LDA is a little bit more efficient because you're using this kind of inner product of two embeddings. And then one embedding uh, captures the semantic properties really well. And then the other embedding is find these co-occurrence of words. So those meld together really well. And then so what I found is that I find uh, that these kind of dynamic embedded top models while they're very long and kind of can take a long time even on small data sets they are really accurate because that they're able to really hold on to these semantic properties so well so the topics just overall doing so much better um here i'll go back to the quantity of validation so we kind of see that um the way that uh dang uh, ruiz and Bly did this is that in these methods over here is that they're basically comparing them in a way that they're comparing it to their old LDA, then a little bit improved one, and then the DETM. And almost always, the DETM does better on the bigger data sets because there's more diverse categories. And then we can go ahead and see that the uh, you know, sometimes the topic coherence is a little bit better for the DLDA because it still is really good. But then we can, can see that the topic diversity and overall topic quality is usually better for the DETM on these large data sets. So we just found that this is um, something that would work better for this kind of larger data set as well as something that we were expecting to be really diverse in the beginning. And then so we want to make sure that we captured those kind of ideas that were happening in the beginning and then see how they translate later into the corpus. Very cool. All right. Thanks so much. Yeah, that's uh, that's about that's about our time as well. So very much, a, very much.